The word singularity has an interesting history. It began in astronomy talking about the creation of a black hole, that eventually uh, a star gets to the size, its mass becomes so great that it can't es essentially escape itself. It collapses into itself in an irreversible process and becomes a singularity. Nothing can escape. And I've wondered, uh, in re and then of course people now talk about the singularity being when technology gets so advanced that human beings are no longer human. And that occurred to me as I was uh, looking forward to uh, my conversation with our next guest, Professor Richard Wolf, because I've often wondered whether, in fact, the name of this show to a certain extent reflects my concern that we might be approaching a kind of economic singularity among other kinds, uh, where uh, the system we live under and function under uh, takes on some characteristics that become irreversible and irredeemable unless, unless we do something to change it. And that's part of what I want to talk to him about. So without further ado, Professor Richard Wolf is a, an emeritus professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is also a visiting professor in the graduate program of international affairs at the New School in New York City. He's host of the program Economic Update on Free Speech TV, which makes him, our fellow Free Speech TV host. Uh, that airs, by the way, Tuesday, 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. He's the founder of Democracy at Work, which can be found at democracyatwork.info. Without any uh, more ado, uh, uh, Richard Wolf, thanks for coming back on the program. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Uh, you heard my introduction. I'm sorry if it was a little long, but uh, my concern is pretty much as I stated. As I look at the statistics of inequality, as I look at the statistics of uh, the intractability, seeming intractability of the poverty pro problem here in the United States, still more, it, it may bubble up or down a little bit, still well over 40 million Americans living in poverty, for example. Uh, I wonder, uh, and as I read, for example, The Great Leveler, the book by Walter Scheidel that says when we reach these levels of inequality it take, in history, it's taken a disaster to change. Uh, are we approaching the kind of economic sing singularity under our current system that I talked about, or am I panicking for no good reason? No, I think you're not only not panicking, but that history and the logic of the situation are pretty much on your side of this, uh, the estimate you're making. Let me, let me put it this way. Um, to hold a society together, there has to be a certain minimum of solidarity, if you like, among people. Doesn't mean that there aren't differences, there always are. And indeed, those differences can become interesting ways for people to uh, teach each other new ways of thinking or being because they are different. But of course, like all things, if there's too much of it, if the difference becomes too extreme, then it ceases being something interesting bringing people together and becomes the opposite, a wedge driving people apart. And nowhere is that more the case than when we're talking about income and wealth. A society that becomes extremely unequal is basically destroying the things that hold folks together. It makes for enmity, envy, jealousy, bitterness, the, the luck that always determines who's rich and who isn't no matter what the rich do to try to pretend it wasn't luck, it could have, couldn't have happened to anybody else, etc. The mass of the people who are kept poor, they know better, they understand it, even if they can't put it into words. And we can see historically that societies that become too unequal literally blow themselves up. And in capitalism, here's a way to understand it. Wealth in capitalism has to do with owning and operating big corporations. And for those corporations to be successful, what they produce has to be bought by the population at large. If you make the population at large too poor to buy what the corporations produce, 
you basically deny the corporations and those who own them the profit that their wealth led them to believe was waiting for them. In other words, in the end, the rich depend on the poor to be not too poor. Okay, that'll work for a while. But if the rich push for more and more wealth, they break their own dependence on the poor. That's what's been going on in the United States for the last 40 years. We had a growing wealth of the corporate leadership of this country, started in the 1970s and really took off for the end of the last century and into the beginning of this one. Meanwhile, the mass of American workers were having a harder and harder time. Their wages didn't go up. The only way they could sustain their purchases was by borrowing, and eventually they couldn't carry the debt that they had accumulated. We reached the point, and the first sign was 2008, when the collapse came, when the mass of people could no longer buy what was being produced, could no longer postpone the breakdown by borrowing more because they were already borrowed more than they could pay for. And so the system crashed. Well, we've quote unquote recovered, but nothing fundamental has changed. And over the last two years, for example, the borrowing of the mass of people has once again started zooming up. So I think you're right. We haven't learned the lesson The rich keep pushing for more and more. The tax cut of Trump and the GOP last December is a reward to the richest Americans after 40 years in which they have done better than they ever did before. That's crazy. It's not just immoral, it's economically self-destructive. So I expect, and many of my economist colleagues left-wingers, right-wingers, and those in the middle, they expect that we will very shortly face again the kind of social calamity that comes when a society rips itself apart by allowing the differences in wealth and poverty to go way beyond what any society can sustain. So, Richard Wolff, when you talk about expecting social calamity of that kind, what specifically do you or your colleagues envision? You mean social violence, rioting? Uh, I'm trying to picture that in a concrete way for our, our, our viewers and listeners. Well, you know, each moment in history has its own unique qualities. So it's very hard to predict the forms. And the reason it is, is while this basic story has repeated itself in history, the forms it has taken Mm -hmm. vary quite a bit. But let me respond by an example. In the 1920s, the inequality that had built up in the last half of the 19th century in America blew up and we finally had the explosion in October of 1929, when suddenly the debt that workers had accumulated couldn't be paid off, the goods that American capitalists were trying to sell could find no buyers, and so the system collapsed. Here's what happened. In a very short time, from October of 1929, till the beginning of 1933, three or four years time, production in America collapsed. One out of four people became unemployed. That the official rate was 25%, which means every single family in America had at least one member, father, mother, cousin, uncle, aunt, out of work with few savings That person became a burden on everybody else, plunging the economy into a collapse. At that point, something interesting happened. 
Was it a social calamity? Yes. How did people react to it? Well, here's an example that answers your question. We had a massive movement from below. In a very short time, millions of Americans joined a labor movement that they had never joined before. These were Americans whose parents had never been in a union, but who got the idea that the only way to get through the Great Depression of the 1930s was to join a union. In addition to those millions, hundreds of thousands of Americans joined two socialist parties and one communist party because they listened to those parties say that the problem was the economic system and that made sense to those Americans. When they worked together, the socialists, the communists, and the labor unions, and the organization of the labor unions at that time was called the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO. They went to the then president of the United States and they said to him in almost these words, you're a Democrat, Mr. Roosevelt, we voted you into office. You've now got to help us, the mass of the working people, get through this depression. And if you don't, we won't vote for you anymore and you won't be president much longer. And there's many amongst us who will also go further and tell you there'll be a revolution against capitalism if you don't do something. And we know that you don't have the money because with millions of people unemployed, the government was not receiving taxes from those people. We know you don't have the money, said the unions, the communists and the socialists. But we know, like you know, Mr. President, where the money is. It's in the hands of the rich and it's in the hands of the corporate owners and operators. So here's what we want, Mr. President. Go get the money from them and pass it to us. In other words, undo the inequality that produced this calamity for us all. Well, Mr. Roosevelt was a smart politician. He knew that all those working people in the unions, the socialist and communist parties put together was an enormous political force. So he went to the rich people from whom he himself came, to the leaders of corporations who were the people he grew up with. And he said to them what had just happened, what the unions and communists and socialists had told him. And then he advised these rich people, look, I advise you to give me a big fat portion of your wealth to pass to the mass of people. And the reason I advise you to do it is that if you don't do it, there could be the kinds of political change that will take away everything you have. So give me a part in order to save the rest. Half of them bought the argument and they gave him enough power that together with the union socialists and communists, he did it. So here's what he did. Number one, in the midst of a depression where the government had no money, he created the social security system. For the first time in American history, everybody who gets to be 65 years of age or older is given a check every month for the rest of his or her life. Wow. He then passed the unemployment compensation bill. We never had that in America either. If you get unemployed, we will give you a check every week for a year or two to help you out. Number three, he passed the first minimum wage so that no one has to work for an amount of money that puts you in poverty. And finally, he created the government jobs program. 15 million Americans without work were immediately hired by the federal government, given a job, paid a decent salary so they could stay and keep their home and keep their family together. And where did the money come from for Social Security, for unemployment compensation, for the minimum wage, 
and for the public jobs? The answer, he taxed corporations and the rich a lot. So that's what he did. He refigured the distribution of wealth and income to offset what the capitalist system had done before. And that's why we began in the 1940s and 50s with a much less unequal society than we had had in the 1920s going into the crash of 1929. And here we sit in 2018, and over the last 40 years, Republicans and Democrats undid what Roosevelt right. was forced to do in the 1930s, undid the New Deal, as it was called, made the unemployment cut, social security benefits cut or delayed until you're older, public employment out of the question, and on and on and on. And here we are back again so that you have to ask correctly the question, are we about to do the same thing to us? And the answer is, we sure look like it. And this time, will it go the way it did in the 1930s? I don't know. It might. But you're right. It might also explode in acts of violence. Look, we already have it. White people in America, a significant number of them, seem to want to believe that the cause, the cause of their economic difficulties are immigrants, or maybe African Americans, or people who have a different ethnicity than theirs. Those are very angry people because the economy is so bad for them. But they're willing to be distracted into blaming folks that have no responsibility for this at all, and, and leaving untouched the people who do. I don't know where that ends up, but that is extremely dangerous. And there's another dimension of this, too. And again, we're talking with Professor Richard Wolff. Uh, one of the other things that strikes me, and, and, and I think it's a great uh, analogy to, to the 1930s, but one of the things that strikes me is that I'm not sure that the wealthy and powerful of today would have the same enlightened self-interest, for lack of a better term, uh, that they did in the 1930s when it comes to ensuring their own survival, it seems to me. And of course, it, back then you had the idealization of wealth as well in, in the blending of wealth and religion. There was the book about Jesus called The Greatest Salesman Who Ever Lived and, and on all of that. But uh, now it seems as if the, uh, the greed has reached uh, a new stage a new nature of potential irreversibility that really concerns me. So, for example, when you describe, uh, and thank you for that, when you describe the fact that uh, corporations need customers, it seems to me that as the middle class has collapsed, as purchasing power has collapsed, those customers are, are, are uh, losing their ability to serve their role in the wealth generation machine. That, that there's a sort of cannibalizing taking place at the very top of the economy now where instead of selling goods to consumers who then pay money that keeps the whole machine sort of moving, we have people just financializing the economy, making money off money instead of off products, and basically burning the furniture for warmth in a way that can't last but provides for short-term prosperity. Does that, does that make any sense to you? Absolutely. I, I put it a little bit more narrowly. American corporations, knowing what their behavior was doing to the purchasing power of the mass of people, have made the adjustment that unfortunately is what's logical in capitalism. If Americans can't buy the stuff, we'll produce it for somebody else. And the internationalization of the last 30 years the setting up of factories and offices and stores all around the world is a kind of adjustment of American capitalism, and this is happening elsewhere in the world too, to an international middle class. It's a kind of deciding, let millions of Americans fall away. Mm -hmm. We don't need them to buy our stuff because we can sell it 
to the new emerging middle class in China, in uh, Europe, in Latin America, even in Africa. And that will be our sustenance. That's why we are more and more internationally oriented. And that's why we don't really care if millions of Americans fall into a level of poverty, of inability to buy things, of living in communities uh, dotted with dead malls where there are no stores functioning anymore. These things which we used to think would only happen elsewhere are happening here. But the, then the big question becomes, how long can you do this before right. the working class and the poor in the United States realizing what is happening and what it means for them and their children erupt in a politically organized way. If I were a capitalist business person, that's what I'd be worrying about. And with a leadership like Trump and the Republicans who care nothing about this, who don't seem to want to deal with it, you've got an even more dangerous risk that this will go so far under them that even if an enlightened government comes next, it'll be too late. Yeah, and that is, of course, and then there's another dimension of this, and, I, and then hopefully we can move from doomsaying to thinking about you know, other potential fixes. But, uh, Professor Wolf, one of the things that uh, strikes me that our political process, the political debate in this country is not appropriately embracing is that I, I, I then look at the climate situation, the criticality of that, the urgency of that, the devastating nature of the climate change we're already seeing, and it seems to me, look, I love to come up with solutions that today's Congress might pass. That is very nice. You know, I'd love to see, oh, here's an idea that today's Democrats would get behind and win elections on. That's all very well and good. But when I look, for example, at something like inequality, but especially climate change, uh, it seems to me that within the current capitalist system, I don't see a way to address this critical threat to our planet under the economic system we have now. It seems to me there's got to be a substantial uh, change among all the developed economies for the planet to be uh, saved from even greater disasters to come. Does that, uh, what do you think? Well, I think my reaction is to use a metaphor. Is it possible to get to the end of the street with one hand and one leg tied behind you. Can you hobble, can you stumble, can you roll and finally get there? I suppose you could, but it's a crazy way to proceed, especially if you have a little knife and can cut the little bit of string that puts your arm and your leg behind you. With your arm and your leg free, you can get to the end of the street faster, with less injury, and in a much more intelligent manner. So for me, the problem is capitalism. You have, capitalism is a system that makes the bottom line, the goal, the focus, profit. Private profit for privately owned and operated enterprises. We have a system that makes that the engine of what happens in our economy. So of course these people don't give a priority to the climate danger that is involved all around them, or to the human danger of creating too great inequality in our society, et cetera, because they're focused on something else. And we're not gonna solve our problems if the important production of goods and services, crucial to all of us, is in the hands of people whose priority is profit rather than having a livable relationship with nature, and having a livable relationship with one another. We have to get to a different system that puts the relationships amongst us and with nature as the bottom line, as the goal. And profit is a distant third, fourth, or fifth priority. Capitalism doesn't work that way. So I reached the conclusion we need another system because this one makes it so difficult, if not impossible, that we're facing the inability to solve the problems 
and that threatens our very existence. Which gets us to uh, our, our, our last topic, which is, uh, and, and maybe you can help me with this, Richard Wolf. I have spent years trying to come up with a, def a definition of the term political economy that sits comfortably in my brain. I, I, I keep hearing people use it a little bit differently, but to me, whether you call it political economy or anything else, it seems to me that as long as we lack absolute barriers between money and politics and, um, and the political process itself, we're not going to be able to address the cutting of the string that you talk about uh, in a meaningful or comprehensive way. And that, that barrier gets permeated not only in the, to me, not only in the obvious ways of campaign contributions or whatever, but when uh, the governor of Pennsylvania, Democratic governor of Pennsylvania and former chair of the DNC becomes, uh, gets a senior position in a, at a hedge fund when a former Democratic president makes uh, tens of millions of dollars working with uh, a hedge funder like Ron Burke or whatever it may be, when, when the last Democratic president's first post-presidential act is a $400,000 speech at an investment firm, the, the, that to me, as long as you have this permeable barrier between the political process and uh, the capitalist economy, we're not going to be able to tackle something like climate change in a meaningful way. But uh, what's the solution there, in your view? Well, I think there are two levels. The field of economics, as we called it, used to be called the field of political economy. If you go back to uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo, the people usually credited with having started the science we call economics, they called it political economy. They all did. Because for them, economics was such an important part of life, literally producing the goods and services without which community life or even individual life is unthinkable, that for them, therefore, economics would always be a major driver of the political way we related to one another. You couldn't separate these things. And for example, it makes it very bizarre that in American universities, we rigidly separate the economics courses we teach students from the political science, as if these two separable things actually exist separately in the world, and they never have, and they certainly don't uh, today. So yeah, we have to put together politics and economics in order that we can solve our problems. And let me give you a very concrete example. We did, some centuries ago, recognize that in politics, we want democracy. We got rid of kings, we got rid of monarchy, we got rid of the tiny number of people at the top making all the decisions for the rest of us who were merely subjects of the king or the queen. And we substituted some democratic organizations, parliaments, congresses, elections, voting, and so on. But we never did it in economics. And that was a fatal mistake. In economics, we allow the absence of democracy that we don't tolerate in politics. Mm. We allow a tiny number of people in every major corporation, the major shareholders, usually 10 out of 15, the people or entities, and the board of directors, they elect usually another 15 or 20. That's it. They make all the decisions what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, what to do with the profits. All the rest of us who go to work nine to five, the vast majority have no democratic power over those decisions. It's the opposite of democracy. Well, it doesn't take a genius to understand if politics and economics are intertwined and you have democracy in one politics, at least to some degree, but you have no democracy in the other one, economics, you may very well see what I believe has happened. That is the absence of democracy in economics has created the inequality that then corrupts the politics to make the democracy disappear in place, putting money as the buyer, as you put it, of the lobbyist, of the candidate, of the political party. And the correction of a solution 
is the end of that split. You have to bring democracy right into the economy. The enterprise, the workplace has to be democratized or else you'll never have a genuine political democracy either. Well, I think that's uh, uh, really, uh, I get a lot out of that response, and I'll be pondering that for a while because I think uh, uh, it has a lot of implications and makes a little light go off in my head, and I like it when that happens. So, uh, Well, maybe we can have another conversation to continue it in the future. I would very much look forward to that. And uh, again, Professor Richard Wolf, uh, Richard Wolf is visiting professor at uh, New School University, and he is the host of the program Economic Update on Free Speech TV. Uh, Richard, it's always great to talk to you, and thanks so much for coming on the program. And thank you for inviting me, and I really meant it. Let's continue it in the future.